This book, One Billion Americans, The Case for Thinking Bigger, is full of them. I know you have probably talked uh, this book to to death, uh, uh, talking with, I watched some of your other interviews you did with folks like Tyler Cowen and mm-hmm. and um, Joe Rogan and uh, a lot of interesting discussions. <laughs> um, so <laughs> so I want to I wanted to ask you some some questions that, you know, yeah. maybe are a little different. Absolutely. So um, something that I guess kind of got me is you frame the immigration proposal because basically you want to bring a billion Americans or you want to get to a billion Americans through two ways. One, a more robust welfare state that would uh, make it easier to have children. And yep. then an immigration uh, policy that would make it a lot easier for people come to, the, to come to the United States. Right? Yep. And you frame uh, uh, the proposal seemingly first and foremost, not just kind of as a way to uh, achieve kind of uh, American greatness, as it were, but to counter the rise of China. Yeah. And so the first thing I want to ask you is, look, uh, you know, the United States is number one. Uh, It hasn't always been the most powerful country in the world. Uh, It has been for the last century or so, but it wasn't always the most powerful country in the world. Um, you know, Britain was once the most powerful country in the world. It no longer is. It's still a perfectly yeah. fine place to live. It doesn't seem now to they're be losers admired. now. And well, what you, I mean, it, it, they seem to have a, a you know fine enough country. They you know at the end of the British Empire, they got as a consolation prize a universal health care. Uh, yeah, you know, they seem they seem to to like their health care system. You know, well, also they're lucky though. Friendly Americans took over from them. Well, that's the the question I'm going to ask is when you say uh, that we have to be number one. Uh, why is that? Why? What is it that you're worried about um, in a world where America is no longer the most powerful country in the world? Well, you know, I mean, I think that some of this is that America um, is at its best when it it strives for a certain level of preeminence, mm-hmm. uh, not because nationalism like per se is good, but, you know, like Joe Biden has this shtick where he's like, America is an idea, you know, and he means that to inspire good things in us. Uh, but part of the question is like, well, what is that idea? Mm-hmm. Right. And I don't think that the idea of America is a quiescent idea. It's not the New Zealand dream, even though New Zealand's a great country and in some ways, you know, a fellow liberal English speaking powers. Mm-hmm. Uh, America is, is, is a big dog. And I think that conceiving of ourselves in those terms has traditionally helped inspire Americans to be more inclusive, mm-hmm. you know, in a, in a way that's, that's important and that's different from some other sorts of countries there. I, I also do think the pragmatics matter. Um, you know, I remember about 15 years ago, there was kind of this vogue that, particularly among uh, Americans and left, it was like, you know, we're all like fucked up and George W. Bush is starting wars for no reason. And maybe this awesome new European project is like gonna be the future of the democratic world. And, you know, I'm not European, uh, but it, it that seemed like a, like a good idea to me. I, I like the idea of an almost like, more, even more liberal, more cosmopolitan kind of national project. I think looking at the world in 2021, that looks a lot less plausible yeah. than it did in 2005. Um, they're having a lot of problems. I'm not a, a Euro skeptic or a cheerleader for the Euro skeptics, but clearly what the Euro files have been selling is like not really working, right? Yeah. Um, you could also have imagined a world in which, you know, India reforms and starts having like supercharged growth and they're like they're the United States to our England, you know, and we kind of take them under our wing and they become the next great constitutional power and mm-hmm. we all do yoga and, you know, they learn English and, and it would be wonderful. But that's not, ex- I, I mean, and we should work on both of those things, right? Like I think people, liberal minded people should try to support a workable version of the European project, should try to support economic development and social development in India. But what is clearly on the horizon as the other big power in the world is a People's Republic of China, which is um, quite like bad, I think, in their internal values. Um, it's admirable how much uh, poverty reduction they have achieved over the past couple of generations. Mm-hmm. But, you know, you look at what they do in Xinjiang, you look at what's happening in Hong Kong, you see that the kind of dream of globalization, that it would democratize China, is not working out. And that, in fact, instead, international businesses... 
uh, interests in China are causing them to, to some extent, like export Chinese authoritarian values. I thought it was very alarming when you had, you know, like the whole NBA coming down like a ton of bricks on a general manager for tweeting solidarity with, with Hong Kong. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a, like a trade guy. You know, I, I go in for the economics of free trade. I got my start at the American Prospect, which was very much a, not a free trade kind of institution. And, you know, I would fight with the editors there and say, you know, comparative advantage, you know, we, we like our, our, our specialization, our goods and services. Uh, but it's become politically, I think, really quite fraught. Mm -hmm. And it's something that the world needs to take more seriously and that I don't think we should view uh, sort of eclipse by the PRC as something that's going to be neutral mm -hmm. for values and liberalism mm -hmm. in the world. Yeah, in fact, it's kind of it's funny you mentioned the NBA because it reminds me of um, you know one of the NBA's promotional materials where not only did they you know show Taiwan as a part of China, but they actively showed the Nine Dash Line and the South China Sea. Like they were to borrow well uh, to use a word. Well, I was going to use a word uh, uh, that is uh, no longer really allowed on Twitch to describe how uh, acquiescent they were to uh, <laughs> the the People's Republic of China. It's just it's it just was sad. Um, and I do remember uh, when you're talking about uh, the growth of Europe, there was a book in 2004 called The European Dream by this fellow named Jeremy Rifkin. And mm -hmm. I remember just this idea that, yes, Europe is the war is, is the yeah, capitalism. That's that's the word, the, the S word that the, this idea, though, that uh, Europe was going to be the uh, the one that was going to just kind of kind of show the way to the future. And it just didn't pan out. You know, I mean. Uh, first, the European Constitution kind of kind of uh, didn't happen, and then Britain left, and now it's you know, the future is very hazy. Yeah, and they, they can't even vaccinate anybody. Yeah, like it's a sad. it's, it's a mess. Well, you know, you talk about you talk about uh, them being a mess, and yet you know, look, uh, China obviously has uh, you know, not only has a lot of problems, to put it mildly, but it, yeah, it's an authoritarian uh, state, a very brutal one at that, and yet the reign of the United States as a great power has been. Uh, you know, to put it mildly, uh, uh, pretty awful from some perspectives. I mean, just a few years ago, we engaged in a war in Iraq. It was absolutely miserable uh, in terms of its outcomes. Uh, uh, brutal, hundreds of thousands dead, arguably on false premises. Uh, the world of the United States, uh, with unparalleled, unchecked power, has not been without its uh, has not been without its problems. Wouldn't it be better that the United States has some some uh, uh, some balance, some pushback, so that we don't get kind of the the uh, disasters of the, the unipolar moment? I mean, there's something to be said for that. I, I would say mostly though, that, you know, I did not mean this to be a, mm -hmm. um, a like quote unquote China hawk book, right? Yeah. The idea here is not like, oh my God, you have to freak out more about China. Yeah. Um, I think that the freaking out to an extent is happening in mm -hmm. the corridors of, uh, you know, the military industrial complex, yeah. things like that. And the point, you know, I want to make is that fundamentally, like America's strength in the world comes from its domestic shit, right? That yeah. it is our technology, it's our economy, it's our human resources that have made us powerful and that ultimately make the, the, the kind of margin. And, you know, I, I've like promoted this book a lot of places. I've mm -hmm. been in a lot of shows, yeah. conservative shows, leftist mm -hmm. shows, libertarian shows. It's been interesting to me. I think everybody should be interested in my book. Yeah. Uh, but the, the national security community people, like the Massachusetts Avenue think tanks, like they are really not. Like really? they are not interested in this argument. They don't care. They want a bigger Navy, that you sounds... know, like that's, but, but that's their vision. You yeah. know, like they argue over there between, should we just spend hundreds of billions of dollars on fighting China mm -hmm. or should we also fight Iran? <laughs> right? Like that's the, that's the, the, the range of the, the arguments yeah. that happen there, and I think it's very limited. It's a limiting way to think about national strength, mm -hmm. and it's almost um, Soviet. You know, that Did you say you, it's almost it, Soviet? Yeah, oh. in terms of how, you know, 
like the Brezhnev era Soviet Union yeah. was thinking about international competition was yeah. like, well, like it's fine, right? We, um, you know, we're centrally planned so we can dedicate all these resources to our military, mm -hmm. squeeze consumption, things like that. And, you know, for a while, the Soviet Union really was this very formidable adversary. They put Sputnik in the air. Mm -hmm. They they had the best rockets, you know, for, for the longest time, good missiles, nice tanks. Uh, yeah. But we had like a real economy and eventually mm -hmm. that turned and microchips and, and all this other good stuff. And we, to think that our role in the world is going to be going from $700 billion defense budget to 800 billion, uh, I think is is foolish that the fundamental strength that we have is that that Chinese system is not good. It's not as good as ours. And one of the ways in which that manifests itself is that anyone with half a brain who had a choice would come to live here. And that's something that we should be taking advantage of, mm -hmm. not, and it, it makes me sad how much of our politics is dominated by um, like paranoia mm -hmm. that like some asylum seeker somewhere is going to get through and then he's going to mow your lawn and that's going to take a job away from some other guy who might've been a lawn mower. Like it's a, yeah. it's a, I, 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 I both, push back a little bit on the left that wants like no immigration controls mm -hmm. to say, look, you know, it's legitimate for people to want like borders and things like that. But it's such an opportunity for us yeah. as a country. And to think of it only as a threat is, is really short sighted. Well, so that's why I, I start off asking uh, a little bit about about China, because it seems like, uh, you know, I, I guess it seems like when you mentioned China, uh, to what extent are you using China as kind of a rhetorical device to persuade people who normally wouldn't be interested in mass immigration to support your agenda, kind of versus having a genuine concern about an increasingly dominant China? You know, it's a concern that I really came to have more of. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you could frame... Uh, Maybe if I could do it all over again, mm -hmm. I would have would have framed it a little bit differently mm -hmm. uh, from, from how I did. But I thought that the I thought that Trump's theme of national greatness was actually important. Um, I thought that that was, you know, everybody after Trump won kind of wanted to like grab onto some part of like, hey, maybe this makes sense that if we have like a non nincompoop in charge of it. Yeah. I always kind of thought the like quote unquote, economic anxiety narratives that people would tell, though, didn't make any sense. They didn't they didn't align with anything. Uh, whereas the idea of like patriotism and people caring about America mm -hmm. and not liking the sort of declinist spirit that yeah. had set in on one level, but also a people on the left, um, I think, can become excessively critical yeah. of America in a way that it, it's it's sort of right, you mm -hmm. know, in like a narrow sense, but in like in a comparative sense. Um, I, I like I sometimes listen to people on the left, and it sounds like they think like that there's no racism in other countries or something, or that like the United States is the only place that um, has uh, treated indigenous people poorly right. when actually that's like that's every yeah. place that's like yeah. the most banal thing about there's America, literally a right? genocide against the indigenous people of east turkestan going on right now in the right. republic of china and right and that, and not to be a pure what about is yeah. about that stuff but right. to, to have that be your understanding mm -hmm. of what america is i think is really sort of impoverished yeah right? i agree uh, but then the trump understanding that like make america great again in this like really literal way, like make America like how it was in the past. Mm -hmm. Like that's not how you be great, right? right? Like the America that Trump is nostalgic for was a dynamic, rapidly changing America, right? In which um, we had a lot of new technology, we had very high productivity growth, we had the civil rights movement was happening, we were changing our immigration laws, right? Yeah. And so to sort of like go back into that river in this backwards looking way, I think is really wrong, mm -hmm. right? And I think that this is a path to greatness that um, incorporates a lot of progressive ideas and incorporates a lot of, you know, 
broadly liberal and cosmopolitan values, but in a patriotic way, not in a um, like, let's dissolve the country kind of way. I see you have all these flags behind. You, so. <laughs> yeah, that's part of my uh, my setup here. And I look, I, I, um, I share that sentiment. I mean, I try to ask questions that are a little more critical sometimes, but I do, you know, personally share that sentiment. And what was interesting about reading a lot of the critiques of your book um, was that a lot of them said, yeah, we like a lot of his ideas. What we don't like, though, is this America greatness thing. You know, we're not into that. And I remember there was one interview in particular, uh, or not interview, one uh, uh, critic, uh, uh, Nathan uh, Robinson of, uh, I think, Current Affairs, uh, yeah. who uh, folks may know very well from his very uh, eccentric style of writing and dress, who, as uh, he says specifically, <laughs> that nationalism is a brain disease and uh, that what we need to really start doing is identifying with the human race writ large. And I just mm-hmm. was thinking, yeah, okay, sure. Um, you know, I get that and I, you know, I'm on board with that. But what does that do exactly to, uh, you know, how do you, you know, when Matthew Glaces is talking about China, uh, the People's Republic of China and the Chinese Communist Party are not sitting there in their uh, Politburo <laughs> offices thinking, yes, how do we identify with the human race writ large? How do well, we you know, and I also think, you know, Nathan's a, a, a socialist, right? Mm-hmm. One of these, these modern day um, socialists. And people like that are not taking seriously mm-hmm. the conceptual and political foundations of the welfare state from, yeah. from their perspective, right? I mean, I, I'm i always like a, like a higher synthesis guy, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I think that serious uh, liberals understand that like a stable institutionally viable path for human freedom needs to include some kind of social welfare provision Mm -hmm. so that people are bought in and the economy works for everyone, even while capturing the values of, of markets and things like that. Conversely, like, Welfare institutions that function and take care of people need a sense of the the nation that defines who is in and who is out of the the scope of the enterprise. Mm -hmm. Because if you were to look in a totally abstract Nathan Robinson kind of way, you would say, well, we should just scrap everything, make no effort to make sure that Americans have health care or social security or anything like that. And, you know, just give some money to Kenya. Mm -hmm. Um, Those people are much, much, much poorer. And that's this kind of like um, uh, Brian Kaplan, like pure open borders, right? Um, And I like, I I am so much in agreement with Brian about immigration economics. Yeah, we, yeah. We, we had him, we talked with him about it on the, on the stream a few months back. Yeah, yeah I mean, he's, there you go. he, he wrote he's a great a, book about it. He, he's a brilliant guy. But I mean, his idea of openness to the world is to like dissolve the nation. Hmm. And to me, like, I don't think that makes sense. But it makes more sense than Nathan Robinson's idea yeah. where you're going to dissolve the nation, but also it's going to be socialism, you know, like, well, so I guess what I'm what the reason I'm curious about this is that the first question, uh, kind of the foremost question that I, I have when we talk about open borders or when we talk about vastly increased immigration, um, mm-hmm. is how do you make that more politically viable given the knee jerk reaction a lot of people have against it? And while we're talking about Brian Kaplan, for example, he wrote that book, uh, The Myth of the Rational Voter, where he talks about. Uh, the biases a lot of voters have against anti, you know, anti-foreign bias, anti-market bias, uh, this idea that you know the economy is a fixed pie, something we we talked about or at least alluded mm-hmm. to a few, few minutes ago. I mean, how do we overcome this stuff? That's kind of why I was so interested in the discussion of China. That seems like one way to do that. But but how do you uh, how do you make that case to people in your view? Yeah, I mean, I do think that you have to both push back against sort of anti-foreign bias. I mean, when mm-hmm. I, I, I I try to write a few times every year, mm-hmm. some article that's like, no, immigrants don't reduce your wages, you know, mm-hmm. kind of thing. There's always some iteration of that because people have this instinctual zero-sum worldview. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I also do think it's important in your politics, in your discussion, right, if you, if you care about these things, to front load the benefits to America mm-hmm. of immigrants and to try to push for immigration policy ideas that are clearly about benefiting 
America, right? That the the frame of the sympathetic asylum seeker and the border agent blocking her, it tugs at the heartstrings of a certain segment of the population. Yeah. But it's clear that the majority, um, if you ask them to accept immigrants as an act of charity toward foreigners, has a very limited sort of appetite for it. And so, you know, I, I talk in the book, not just about sort of America on the international stage, but about immigration as a strategy to revitalize cities that have mm -hmm. lost population. I do talk about, you know, trying to emphasize um, skilled workers, things like that, but to try to get people to see that, like, we could and should have a much larger volume of immigration to this country, uh, not just to help the immigrants, mm -hmm. but because immigrants are so, foreigners are so eager to immigrate yeah. that like it is possible to take advantage of that fact in a way that, you know, is helpful to everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a, it's a challenge. I mean, you know, it, it, people, most people have an excessively zero sum view of the world. And um, you sort of got to work on that. It's a problem with the way politics is polarized in the United States. You know, we used to have a sort of um, uh, thin layer of cosmopolitan elite mm -hmm. sort of running both political parties. <laughs> and now there has been a lot of sorting on that yeah. so that increasingly like all the people who see the non-zero sumness of the world mm. are in the democratic coalition yeah. um but it's still not a majority yeah. to win you know and and so it's it's become a little harder to like suppress conflict around certain kinds of issues um you know, which is bad. I mean, it's it's unfortunate. Like, it, I I believe in democracy, uh, but like elites do matter, mm. and you now have a group leading the Republican Party that doesn't have a strong like sense of conscience around some of these kind of questions, yeah. Yeah. and they will exploit them to the hilt for electoral gain in a way that's that's challenging. And I wish we could. I wish we could go back. I wish we could get some more uh, uh, country bumpkin folk, you know, who voted for John Kerry back in the Democratic coalition and like give back some of the high minded suburbanites to the Republicans. Because I actually think that politics of 10, 15 years ago uh -huh. was healthier for the country. Really? I mean, again, though, I mean, the politics of 10, 15 years ago, I mean, that that was the politics that not only got us into Iraq, that responded to the 2008 financial crisis with, a, you know, a comparatively austere financial package. Oh, no, the I mean, policy was terrible. Oh, okay. the, I see. But the, <laughs> the tone of politics itself. Okay. I'm saying the, 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 the political dynamic. Okay. When, I see when, what you're saying. When, yeah. when the Democrats were a little bit more populist and yeah, the Republicans were a little bit less. Yeah. That that's yeah. just a. Now, as I say, like elites matter, right? Yeah. I get what and you're unfortunately, what happened is that the elites made some very poor mm. governing decisions. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's like also not not good. Okay. Well, I can I can understand where you're coming from there. Um, and I, you know, I guess um, like to talk about immigration, for example, I know in the book you call open borders something approaching an inviolable scheme. Um, so when you talk about when you say that, um, but then you talk about some of these ways that we need to nevertheless massively uh, up immigration. Do you mean that it's like a political impossibility or do you mean that it's like operationally inviolable in some fashion? Um, what do you mean when you say that? It's some combination of the two, right? Mm -hmm. Like, because there's always politics, even mm -hmm. if you like assumed away all public opinion constraint, right? If you just had unlimited quantities of people mm -hmm. showing up in a very disorganized way with no infrastructure plan, housing plan, no uh, tax schemes to compensate it. Like there's just, there's bound to be some kind of backlash. Uh, now, the United States used to have a kind of system of fairly uh, formally open borders. Yeah, I mean, uh, up but until, with a, right? up until the yes. early 20th century. But informally, mm -hmm. there was um, a big amount of restriction on immigration from Latin America mm -hmm. in the form of people being incredibly racist. 
you know, to like, it, it was a major disincentive. Yeah. to like move from Mexico into the heart of Jim Crow, Texas. Um, so like that was also not great, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we had uh, less restriction than we have now, quite mm -hmm. a lot less. Um, and that worked. Uh, we didn't have sort of advanced welfare state institutions back then. So you didn't need to sort of incorporate immigration into that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, I do think that you could go a lot opener Mm -hmm. than we are now, and I would welcome that. Um, and then a big part of the book, I mean, if people haven't read it, right? Yeah. A, a lot of the book is about like housing and transportation and other things like that, that I just think are necessary complements mm -hmm. to a population growth policy, right? Mm -hmm. it, because, you know, if you, like people have to go somewhere, there needs to be some way to get around. Mm -hmm. um, I think it is uh, valid to be like, well, if there were three times as many people, wouldn't there be more traffic jams? Sure. Um, and so there's like a lot of discussion about that. It's not as big a question of high principle, but I mm -hmm. do think it's important. Yeah, like I, I appreciate the discussion. I mean, particularly um, in the book when you talk about the fact that, look, you know, your national parks aren't going to disappear just because we've got three times the population. People will typically want to live. I mean, a lot of people are going to want to live in the cities. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. you're still going to have your country. You're still going to have a population. That's what I think you said. Uh, something approaching three or four times less dense than England, you know? Oh, um, yeah. I mean, so, so triple triple the, the U.S. population. I mean, it sounds like a lot, but mm -hmm. we'd still be somewhat less dense than France, uh, about half the density of Germany, mm -hmm. uh, way less than, than the U.K. or the Netherlands. Um, you know, and those are all nice places. Uh, you know, they, they have parks, they have forests, yeah. they have farms. Um, mm. There's like a lot of room for everything. People mostly like to live. I mean, Americans, we can get very uh, touchy about the difference between like living in the city and living in the suburbs. Mm -hmm. But either way, you're talking about living in a built up urban area. That's where people want to live near like some other stuff. Mm -hmm. And then there's a little bit of variation about how much they care about parking. Um, not that many people want to live like smack dab in the middle yeah. of nowhere. It's very inconvenient. So beyond appealing, I guess, to the geopolitical competition and sort of greatness that we were talking about before, um, do you have any, what kind of what strategies would you recommend for building the kind of political coalition necessary to sort of open the doors uh, more? Uh, mm -hmm. you know, in the way you describe, like, you know, for example, should we stop talking? Should we stop using the phrase open borders? Should we stop talking about, you know, limited immigration? I mean, how do we, how do we build that? How do we build that coalition? Well, you know, I mean, people can talk about whatever they want. Um, you know, part of this is that like, I did want to break through into the national security mm -hmm. dialogue. Yeah, I can't um, believe they, they weren't more that, interested. That, in that, that remains a powerful like force in American political life. I would love to see some admiral say somewhere, look in the long run, <laughs> yeah. like no matter how many sea launched ballistic missiles I have, if we're outnumbered four to one, like that's not great. Um, or for somebody to say, not only do we have immigrants serving proudly in the Marine Corps, but immigration broadly is a source of national strength. I'd mm -hmm. say like, that's yeah. great general, like thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> and you know, and, and, and I, I am always, always looking for that because I want to, you know, I don't think that you do things fundamentally by assembling um, narrow partisan coalitions mm -hmm. that like pass one thing one time, right? Yeah. Broad presumptions and elite consensuses shift over time. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I want right wing people who, um, you know, love Donald Trump and 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 see how this went to even them say, uh, maybe I should focus a little bit less on who I want to kick out of the country and a little bit more. You know, Trump would say like, well, why can't we get more Norwegians? Uh, but he but then he would never actually have a meeting right. where he sits down and he's like, well, like, why can't we get more right. Norwegians? Right. You know, like, OK, not that many people live in Norway, but like yeah. it's I, I, a, a really striking experience I had earlier in my career when, when we were starting Vox is, mm -hmm. you know, we had these different resumes from different people and we we're making job offers. And one of them was from 
a journalist who was living in London and working for a British paper. And before that, some of her clips were from a Canadian paper. Mm. And I was like, okay, you know, and, and somebody else really wanted to hire her. Yeah. And so like, I sent the memo on to Vox Media Legal and they came back and they were like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And I was like, what? And they're like, well, we're gonna have to get a visa. And I was like, what do you mean? Because immigration politics is like all about, you know, Mexicans gonna take your jobs. It's never right. about like, is a Canadian science <laughs> reporter gonna take your jobs? Yeah. Particularly because um, you could get a freelancer, right? Like you, we could commission articles from her mm -hmm. while she's living in London, no problem. Mm -hmm. But it was like, we wanted her to be able to come to the office. You know, it's a nice, she, she lives in Austria now, very yeah. globalist. Um, but. It was this whole thing and we had to apply, we had to certify that she was an alien of extraordinary ability. And, you know, then there was like trouble getting a renewal, but fortunately she married a diplomat. And, oh my God. But you know, it, so, okay. So like, let's get more Norwegians. You know what I mean? Like, I, why shouldn't people from NATO allied countries who have yeah. college degrees yeah. and job offers that pay over the median wage. Like let's completely, let's let them haul in. Like how about open borders with Canada? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Are they, are they going to come here to like mooch off our shit healthcare? Yeah. Like that doesn't make sense. <laughs> right. But America has great stuff. You know, if you live in Canada, you're like, man, it's fucking cold here. Um, I don't care about my free health care. I want to come to America. I want to get a job. I want to work. Like, what's wrong with that? Like, what are we afraid of? You yeah. know, right? And not <laughs> yeah. just like, yeah. what, what am I globalist afraid of? Like, what are you like racist Trump guy afraid well, of? Like Canadians? Like, is that so? Well, I, look, I mean, I guess, first of all, when you mentioned Canada and, and the cold, I know a lot of, you know, there might be some people rolling their eyes at that, but as a Floridian, I live in a state that has basically uh, six month a year expatriate Canadian communities. They come here for six months. They go back to Canada for six months so they don't lose any of the. I think there's a six month rule with respect to benefits. <laughs> you know, they don't want to lose any of that stuff. So they just They're coming in droves. Here, right? You know, I mean, and they, uh, you know, they walk among us unknown. You know, who knows? <laughs> who knows what they you just, you got to ask to say, what's that about? <laughs> no, I got it. Right, yeah. It's it's um but you know, all, all kidding aside though, I, I, I do um appreciate that. I was wondering if you read our chat because our friends at the Neoliberal Project literally just said we should open the borders with Canada. That's the first step. <laughs> that would be yeah, like what's the what's the argument there? And at one point we had something like that, I think, before nine eleven in terms of it. Yeah, least more or less. My side. Um, um yeah. yeah, so you know, I do I just like I wanna push people mm -hmm. to be like, okay. Like let like let me work with you. Like what what can we do here? Like you know, yeah. okay, you you don't want to press one for Spanish. Uh, so let people from the Bahamas come. They yeah. speak English. Like guess, what yeah. like mm -hmm. what what's up here? I think actually that's that's interesting. You, you put that kind of like a sort of a keyhole solution or a question of like okay, if you're serious then about you want immigration from some places and not others, you'd at least want to ask why that's not the case. And it turns out we've made immigration harder from everywhere. Yeah, it's really yeah. hard. It's yeah. hard to immigrate to the United States legally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's, uh, although I suppose that gets to another issue that, uh, that we have with respect to, to immigration. Um, you know, really, why would somebody from Norway, I mean, this, this country that in most of American political discourse is regarded as somewhere between, you know, utopia and fantasy land. You know, oh, I'm sure it is, it's lovely. It, it, which seems like it is, you know, <laughs> it seems like by all accounts, a very lovely country. Um, it has a, a robust uh, welfare state. People are very happy. Um, a lot of these European countries have these robust uh, welfare states. Uh, the, the public seems to like them uh, more than dislike them, at least, even if they may, may grumble about the specifics sometimes. Um, and yet, you know, I know the other big idea in your book is we need policy that will, will make it easier for people to have children. Yes. Well, uh, even in France... Uh, which has uh, one of the most robust healthcare systems in the world, they really haven't been able to make fertility rates budge all that much. And France has, I think, the highest fertility rate in Europe, uh, somewhere just north of, uh, I think, two two uh, children per, per woman. Um, mm -hmm. Most of them are, are below that. Some of them are very well below that. Uh, do we really have the ability to do much in the way of, uh, you know, sure, there may be other arguments for, for having mm -hmm. uh, yeah, benefits for families, make it easier to have children. But, I mean, in terms of boosting fertility rate, it doesn't seem like governments are really able to do much there. 
you know, I think this is where it depends what sort of much uh, means, right? I think that pronatalist policies wind up getting a bad reputation because they are often pushed by um, sort of far right type politicians, you know, like, so like the Hungarian government yeah. got very jazzed up about this. And these are politicians, political movements that fundamentally sort of hate the welfare state. And then they say like, oh, but you know, maybe it's okay if it gets people to have more kids. And they do like this whole big thing <laughs> and it has a kind of marginal impact. Mm -hmm. And then they say, oh, fuck it, that didn't work. Um, on the other hand, if you think, right, so like Joe Biden evidently thinks mm -hmm. that child poverty is bad. So he put this refundable child tax credit into mm -hmm. his uh, rescue plan. Democrats all voted for it. They talked about it a lot. They were like, we're gonna cut child poverty in half. Like, this is really important. Um, they never said, like anywhere in that whole discourse that, you know, if you look at Lyman Stone's estimates from the Institute for Family Studies, we think this will probably boost fertility by about 0.2 children uh, mm -hmm. per woman if it's made permanent. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's like, that's what his research shows, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a benefit in a world where the average American family has about 0.7 fewer children than they say they would like to have. Mm -hmm. And they primarily cite financial means, uh, a financial boost that closes about a third of that fertility gap, mm -hmm. um, like that's significant. That's like a benefit to the policy that I think you should talk about. You know, there's also a sort of, um, I don't know, like a like a moral philosophy aspect to it. Um, we often, you know, even sort of like wonky technocrats who care about cost benefit and things like that, don't think about the existence or non-existence of human beings as a relevant issue. Something that came out too late for me to put in the book, that's mm -hmm. more of a more of a, a right wing point yeah. is that people did these studies on what happened when they raised the age uh, at which you you were required to keep your kids in a car seat. Yeah. Right. And so the way the um, uh, what you would call it, uh, the OMB looked at this, they said, mm -hmm. well, the benefits of this increase are small uh, because you're talking about older kids. So, you know, the the marginal risk was, was really not that big. So this is very low benefits to this policy. But they also said the costs were very low because. These families, you know, if your four-year-old's in a car seat, then keeping them in the car seat for another year, it doesn't cost you that much, right? Because um, you already have the car seat. What, what these researchers found is that a normal car can fit two car seats easily, but you can't fit a third, mm -hmm. right? You need to get a special bigger car mm -hmm. to fit a third car seat. Yeah. So actually making it harder for your oldest kid to age out of the car seat pretty dramatically increases the cost of having a third child. <laughs> so, and then they, they do the math on like how many, and it's like tens of thousands of babies per year wow. being not born according to this estimate. And that just doesn't go into the cost benefit calculus huh. at all, right? So it's like lives saved versus lives lost counts, mm. but lives created doesn't count at all. And, and I think if we look at some of the regulations on our childcare providers, you know, so there's like a rule in DC and a, and a lot of states, a, a childcare center has to be on the ground floor basically. Mm. Um, so you can evacuate the kids more rapidly in yeah. the case of a fire, you know, which is like, uh, that's sure. obviously a valid concern, but you do have to like every, ask anybody, like childcare is super expensive, right? And you have to actually do the math. I, I mean, it's, you never want to say you're shortchanging children's security, but, but that is the reality, right? If you dramatically increase the cost of childcare, um, that's a burden on families, but it also means fewer children, right? And you have to really try to be rigorous. Like how many people are you really saving this way? Um, big office buildings in downtown central business districts are not like burning down frequently. This is not a... <laughs> You know, I, I mean, I, 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 I don't want to like joke around no, I about people dying saying, in no. fires, but you yeah. know, I mean, it's like when when's the last time you heard of that? Like, yeah. it doesn't it doesn't make sense really as like a top level policy concern. I mean, I've worked in D.C. 
you know, 18 years, I've been through my three times a year mandatory fire drill a million mm -hmm. times. Once an Argentinian consulate uh, set a bag of popcorn on fire in their in their microwave. <laughs> but that was like the closest thing to a real fire yeah. that I went through. And, you know, somebody grabbed the fire extinguisher and they put it out. Yeah. Like, it's fine. Like, our, we have building codes. Like, it's good. We have really good fire safety. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, you have to take a, a holistic view of these regulatory issues. Yeah. So I, I see what you're saying. You're, it, it sounds like, in essence, instead of thinking about just lives saved and lives lost, what about the lives that, you know, what about the people that will never be born because we have made it harder to have children? Right. Yeah, and that's a little, I don't know, I, I didn't get into you know, metaphysics. And sure. Book. but I, 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 mean, I was a philosophy major in college. Well, it's interesting. Um, and I think yeah. it's an important point. It is. I mean, I was thinking about as a joke, kind of, you know, the, the antinatalist argument where people say, you know, really, is it just so, you know, what's so great about, you know, about existence, right? But, but I mean, what you mentioned there, you know, actually is a sort of interesting point, just the idea that, you know, anything that you implement that makes it harder to have children does um you know does come with that aspect that we really just we often don't talk about um so i think that that that's um i i get that point and i think you're also right i think i really am surprised that that um kind of to go back to another point you mentioned that there was no national security interest in what you're saying because it seems to me that you know um when you think about all these, I see your. Uh, I just. I just realized what the poster behind you says about our washroom breeding Bolsheviks. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, apparently, employees lose respect for a company that fails to provide decent facilities. So, so no. <laughs> I, I had to look that one up though to, to read the small text. But, um, yeah, it, it does seem like a, a country that cannot, um, you know, a country that cannot broaden its base of economic support cannot sustain the uh, uh, this uh, the the. Uh, the the armed forces you'd need you know to meet their interests so i'm surprised that there's not more uptake um about your ideas from those communities who has been i guess the most receptive other than say uh you know i i suppose liberal you know neoliberal types like like uh you know our community here oh i mean it's it's all about neoliberals yeah. um no you know i mean i think that some of the people in the uh sort of like reform conservative space mm -hmm. um, have been interested. You know, there's been this um, slightly goofy effort to like create an intellectual backfill of like Trumpism yeah. because he won an election and now yeah. people want to uh, make that mean something. Uh, but I've had, you know, good conversations with, with those people, with my, my sort of new friends at the Niskanen Center who mm -hmm. were ex-libertarians. I yeah. mean, I think, I think that this is a, um, a convergent idea for people from different kinds of perspectives who've become a little bit unmoored from mm -hmm. uh, the kind of um, hard polarization that characterizes politics mm -hmm. right now in the United States, because that really is on some level what I mean, the book, the book's about many things, and mm -hmm. it's also not that long. Yeah. Everyone should read it. Uh, but, you know, it, it's about really trying to think in terms of a of a national project um in which people are, you know people are just going to disagree about certain things mm -hmm. about like the value of guns about you know the the metaphysics of abortion mm -hmm. about the economics of the income tax things like that uh but i i would like aspirationally to have a politics that is more about like making america good and beating other people <laughs> than yeah. about beating each other. Yeah. Right. Which is like, I feel like a lot of what we are doing now in America is like people hating on their neighbors. Um, and I do think, I mean, I, I don't want to be like a, like a super nationalist warmonger, mm -hmm. but it is really worth reflecting that, you know, whatever disagreements I have with Brian Kemp, uh, they're just like not that big compared to my disagreements with uh, Xi Jinping. Yeah. You know, yeah. and like, but I wish he would also reciprocate that feeling, you know, <laughs> that like that, like owning the libs is like actually not yeah. the essence of the conservative project in America. Um, and then, you know, the libs could be like, look, like demolishing the history of the United States is not the essence of a progressive project either. Yeah, it is. It is somewhat. There's certainly a tension there because, like, 
you know, I certainly want to acknowledge all of uh, America's problems, but at a certain point, it seems like there are folks out there who, you know, once you engage in that project, they find it very difficult to then come to the, uh, you know, to then, I guess, compartmentalize that to some degree and then say, uh, but nevertheless, uh, this country is uh, a, a sort of an institution of institutions that we need if we're going to have uh, all these other good things we want, you know, a world where there's individual freedom and you know, a world where there's trade, uh, you know, between nations rather than kind of this uh, rising sort of Chinese uh, anti-globalism, you know, globalism. Yeah, and I mean, and and, and in America that, you know, um, actually does a better job of encapsulating pluralist and um, I think anti-racist yeah. ideas than, I mean, not a lot better than China does, yeah. but I think better than most countries yeah. do. Yeah. You know, that this is not, it's not to deny the things that the critics say about the United States so much as it is to ask for some uh, perspective. Um, and also, you know, at the same time to recognize that, that you know, right-wing politics is a thing that exists. Mm -hmm you know, in all places, as far yeah. as I know, there's like, there's a conservative political party in Jamaica. Um, and that some of that is for, I think like wrongheaded aspects of human nature, mm -hmm. but some of it is because of like bona fide economic policy disputes yeah. where progressive people can be very blah about, you know, how things actually work and the importance of incentives. Mm -hmm. uh, and that there's just like more to the United States than its internal uh, cultural conflicts and, yeah. and problems. And that, you know, I, I remember, um, I, I'm probably, this is probably a super old reference. No, let's, Jewish, let's hear it. But no, so, I, so I'm, I'm Jewish and I remember when Joe Lieberman got, got the vice presidential nomination and I'm watching him at the Democratic convention in 2000. Mm -hmm. And he says like only in America, da, da, da. And I was like a young pedant, even as a, a 17 year old. And, yeah. you know, I wanted to like reach, I was just like, you know, there's been two Jewish prime ministers of France. Like mm -hmm. it's not true. Uh, it's only in America, uh, but it is, true that like Jewish people have done very well here in the United States. Yeah. That is uh, something that speaks well of us, that mm -hmm. there has um, never been the kind of like hard anti-Semitic backlash yeah. in government that you see in many countries. Um, and then, you know, nine years after I watched that, right, like Barack Obama is the president of the United States. Yeah. And there's no, there's no like French Obama. There's no Italian Obama, right? Mm -hmm. Like the the United States is a country that has uh, African Americans and Black culture, like at the very core of its identity, yeah. at achieving extraordinary levels of success across a variety of fields as big movie stars, star athletes, political stars, president of the United States, and that like that's good, and that we are trying to build on a positive record of achievement and inclusion that you know has been a big theme of the last 50 years of our history well you know that i guess i i really appreciate that um because it feels like whatever like our ambitions might be in the sense of like a more just society it feels like, and this is sort of a squishy point that I, I guess I, I don't have any empirical basis for, although I imagine there must be, there might be <laughs> some there, but the idea um, that in a large continental diverse country like the United States, we have to have something to, some kind of glue that unites us. And especially given the United States is more a political project than, you know, an ethno-religious project, it seems like what... I guess what I appreciate about your book is it seems like an attempt to sort of address that, you know, to, to sort of meet people where they live, which is a sort of desire to be a part of something bigger, part of something, yeah. better, you know, and I think that that is something that maybe um, particularly on the on the left um, is a hard thing to uh, get behind. And on the right, um, people maybe get behind in a way that is sort of very exclusionary and sometimes very destructive. But I, I, I don't know, I appreciate that kind of meet people in the middle where they live, where I think most people are, which is they want to be a part of an inclusive project that nevertheless means something, you know, because it's just sort of 
we should just be for humanity, guys, just doesn't really cut it. You know? No, I agree. I mean, until until the 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 you know aliens there, like that, yeah, guns, then that changes or, or yeah, something. I mean, I've I've always believed. I mean, whether it's uh, this is like a joke Ronald Reagan apparently used mm -hmm. to make, but you know, it's like oh yeah, well, the, if the if Martians the came, came, we mm -hmm. we would unite with the Soviets and yeah. and fight them off. And mm -hmm. I mean, like I I think that that's true, mm -hmm. right? And you know, and I do hope that you know over time humanity mm. will be more united yeah. probably not in fighting martians but in you know <laughs> trying to address uh global pandemics mm. i guess used to be a good go-to yeah. example of this so, and other kinds of things like that but like we do we we have to we have to operate in the world that exists before us yeah. so uh matt i realize we've already been talking now for about 50 minutes um, so I want to ask some questions from our audience. I also want to ask you about some foreign policy. So I wanted to see if you wouldn't mind staying with us for a few more minutes. Or oh, sure. If you have to leave on the hour, then, then we can. Nah. Okay. Let's take well, some questions. Okay. So let me ask you real first and then uh, real quick first, and then we'll go to our questions from our audience. So folks, if you have some questions, type them out and I will get to them. Uh, we'll, we'll do as many as, uh, as, as we can. So the one thing I want to ask first though is about foreign policy. You had a, uh, pretty, I suppose, widely, um, uh, widely circulated tweet, and then I, I think you wrote about it too on Substack. Yeah. Um, about how the Middle East doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, and it seemed like you know the apart from the bigger issue of the book and of immigration and uh, you know kind of policies to raise fertility, a lot of people were saying you need to call this guy out on on immigration, or not immigration on foreign policy and in yeah. his internationalist takes. Yeah. Or rather, isolationist takes. Mm -hmm. So, what exactly? Um, I, I mean, how can you say, particularly when you make a book that you know I know isn't primarily about China, but opens yeah. up with an argument about you know, look, uh, China, yeah. China's a big deal. How can you say, uh, you know, the Middle East, this part of the world where China gets most of its oil, you know, most of its fuel, and it doesn't matter. You know, like how can you how can you make that argument? Look, the United States for the past twenty years. Um, probably more than that, has been really obsessed with the like regional balance of power in the mm. Middle East. Um, multiple wars, huge military presence, trillions of dollars. And the unspoken assumption behind all of that is that this is a strategically vital region right, that it matters. Um, I, I, some people came back at me with like, well, millions of people live there, don't they matter? And like, yes, obviously, right? Like uh, humanity matters. Yeah. Uh, the people of Peru matter. Uh, the people of Kenya matter. The people of, of Malaysia matter, right? But the premise of American foreign policy has been that the Middle East matters more than those other parts of the world that it is strategically vital. Mm -hmm. um, and I just don't think that that is true. The, the economics of the oil weapon concept mm -hmm. have never made sense. And they make less and less sense with every sort of passing year that the United States develops more domestic energy resources that make less and less sense the more you think about the environmental problems of fossil fuel reliance. Uh, but like fundamentally, it just has never made sense like we're not contrary to trump like we don't take the oil yeah right like we just we buy oil yeah and global markets and like it's fine um the reason it's a valuable resource is that other people pay money for it uh but that means we don't need to like be there um, and we definitely don't need to get sucked into the specific psychodrama of the saudi iranian regional rivalry, which drives so much activity in DC. I mean, all these think tanks are, uh, they're like, they're fronts, you know, for a handful of foreign governments and for defense contractors um, who pump them up. And they sold people this, this bill of goods um, after 9-11. And it's been like a real disaster for the country. And I don't accept the view, right? I mean, I, isolationist is a concept that people came up with in the 30s yeah. to describe people who wanted to be totally uninvolved yeah. in the rise of Nazi Germany, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, you know, like that was bad. Mm -hmm. uh, that's in the 20s though. Like before Nazi Germany existed, yeah. there was a group of people who 
I think also get roped in as the quote unquote isolationists, but they were classic liberal internationalists. Like in the real sense, they wanted trade mm -hmm. with the world. Yeah. They wanted diplomacy. They wanted a world where people travel mm -hmm. and know each other and yeah. see each other and to not be hyper nationalists. And that's what I want. Like I, I want us to be engaged with the world as human beings. Uh, rather than engaged with the world as a global military presence. Well, so then let me ask you a follow up here, because it sounds like what you're saying with the Middle East, you could, you know, maybe you could say uh, you're saying, uh, you know, we want less involvement in the Middle East, uh, you know, but we, you know, we, we want to spend our resources elsewhere. But what about maybe more traditional commitments like NATO, you know, in Europe mm -hmm. or like our commitment to defend vague as it is yeah. at the moment to defend Taiwan? You know, our firmer commitments to Japan, South Korea. Do you want to unwind those? You know, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, NATO, I think, has gotten to be a um, troublesome topic uh, for the United States because mm -hmm. we kind of, um, we kind of, on the one hand, like pushed a little too far into Ukraine and Georgia and antagonized Russia a lot and then didn't quite have like a plan. Mm -hmm. Right. So we have like neither incorporated those yeah. countries into our sphere of protection mm -hmm. nor like conceded them to Russia. So we're now have sanctions on Russia yeah. because they took Crimea, but also they're obviously not giving Crimea back. Yeah. It, it requires some some kind of rethink. Um, you know, I think the diplomatic relationship with Japan, with Korea um, has worked out very well for everybody involved. It's not super costly to the United States. Yeah. I think it's perceived as beneficial over there. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that we should encourage um, those countries to uh, relate to each other, you know, bilaterally and not just see the United States as their go-to intermediary. I was reading this very interesting article the other day about the defense politics of Taiwan. Yeah. And they were saying that in Taiwan, um, there's like very little political support for defense spending. Um, somebody floated the idea of conscription and it, everyone was like, no, 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 no. Nobody's worried about China at all. Um, I'm not like an expert in this kind of stuff, mm -hmm. but that all like that sounds incorrect to me. Mm -hmm. Like, I feel like they probably should be worried. Yeah. And I do not want the United States to be conveying some kind of message to East Asia that's like, like, we've got this. Like, don't worry at all. I, I see. Like, I, saying, yeah. I, I would like just to be helpful. Yeah. Right. And like, but you know, I mean, again, you talk about isolation. Like, nobody was thinking in 1934 that France is going to be like, whatever. We don't need to worry about Germany. Yeah. America's got it. Right. And right. said, like, we were being like counterproductive. We yeah. were being like, we we won't sell you any weapons. Like, right. we don't give a shit what happens here. Yeah. And yeah. we we should not do that. Like, we want to be there for democratic Asia, mm -hmm. I think as people who share common values okay. um, and, uh, about the world, but we should not, um, cause like, it's not true, right? Like the United States is not going to blow up the world for the sake of Taiwan, I think. Wow. I mean, I don't, I, I mean, don't know. The reason but... I ask is that if you're saying like we should encourage them to be more active participants in their own self-defense, sure. But if you're saying like, uh, I guess if you're saying like, no, we just shouldn't like, we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't go in on defending Taiwan. Uh, I mean, that's a clear position, but presumably any defense of Taiwan comes with that risk, doesn't right. it? Right. But I mean, that's why we're like, we've got to, uh, what, what we want is for China to not attack Taiwan. Yeah. Right. right. And that means I think like trying to trying to trying to help. Yeah. Trying to help build things up. Right. But like, again, I mean, I'm not super versed yeah. on like Taiwan Strait security. Yeah, I issues. Got you. I got you. But I feel like Taiwan should be a pretty highly militarized yeah. Um, society, like not because I love militarized societies, but because like that is a high level of objective threat that yeah. they are dealing with. And that the relationship should be like, we are giving them some backup, yeah. but also that like they are really going yeah. kind of all in. I mean, so there's this semiconductor issue that's come up mm -hmm. recently that seems like a sort of concrete um, 
topic because Taiwan is so big uh, in that kind of industry, right? Mm -hmm. And we want to um, have some like redundancy there. Um, but like, you know, we I, we should definitely sell them weapons and, and all that kind of good stuff. Um, but also they should buy more. But you are, just to be clear, it sounds like you're a little hesitant though to say we should have, we should make some commitment to help them if worse came to worse. I don't know. I'd have to think You'd about it. I would read some I would read some PDFs on this question. I gotcha. I gotcha. I, that, that's just what I was curious about there because... What do you think? Yeah, full full stop. I mean, okay. these people... You're all, we gotta you're all in on Taiwan. We are, I mean, I, I do agree, though. You're right that... And you see this with South Korea, that it is, too, you know, this idea of kind of a, you know, a more casual attitude toward, uh, you know, especially among the younger generation toward toward military spending and, and uh, you know, in the face of very hostile foreign power, sure. But I, at the same time, I do recognize, like... Taiwan could go full, I suppose, Israel in terms of its self-defense and commitment to conscription, all that, and is still facing, a, you know, one billion plus. Yeah, uh, and I know. just like, I would feel more comfortable yeah, about gotcha. formal alliance mm -hmm. if like they were doing that, yeah, right? Gotcha. If, it, if it was like, they are more militarized than we are, yeah, yeah, but we're sure. bigger than they are. For sure. And like, that's the partnership. For sure. I get you. I think I think that makes sense too to call for that. So we've got a lot of questions here. I'm going to try and get as many as uh, I can as quickly as we can, because um, uh, I've already burned through our agreed upon hours. So I do appreciate <laughs> that very much. Man. All right. All right. Uh, so uh, first of all, here uh, we've got a question from uh, Zerks the Upvoter. Do you have any thoughts on the viability of open border agreements like the Schengen Agreement in the European Union? Um, I mean, I did not like read the fine print on Schengen mm -hmm. when I used to have takes on it. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that in a pandemic, you can just like turn it off turn it or off. something. Yeah. Um, it's just, a. it turns out the European Union has a lot of uh, design flaws. Mm -hmm. I think like conceptual design flaws about what levels of sovereignty exist where. Yeah. Um, that being said, I mean, I think that sort of provisional open borders mm -hmm. would work well for the United States with some of its neighbors. Yeah. Um, you know, because we would not be saying we have a project of total political integration with China, uh, Canada, yeah. uh, but just trying to get back to the pre 9-11 status mm -hmm. quo where you could cross the border easily yeah. would be good. But I even think like more openness. So like you, you mm -hmm. it would be like really easy to get a work visa. Yeah. You know, you just like show up somewhere and you give your fingerprint or, or whatever. Um, so, you know, I, I think that would be fine. And, and I would try to extend that, you know, as as further if people would take it, you know, whatever countries uh, our voters like, you know, Ireland, uh, whatever's out there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, OK, what about uh, Republicans? So I know we've been talking a little bit about, you know, sort of uh, uh, alluding to them, uh, sometimes talking directly about them. What do you think are the odds of a Republican Party that is if not a little more progressive, perhaps a little less of, uh, of what it is today, mm. um, you, you know, uh, or do you think we're kind of stuck with this um, more, I don't want to say reactionary, but I kind of want to say reactionary, uh, uh, populist uh, kind of Republican Party? You know, I don't have a, like a strong sense of the odds. Mm -hmm. These things surprise you. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, I guess to the extent that I differ from anyone. Um, the Republicans really have moderated on certain policy topics mm -hmm. relative to where they were uh, w when I started out in journalism. Mm -hmm. The problem really is that they've become simultaneously more like more bananas, like like more more QAnon-y. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I was saying this before, but like, I, I just, I think that I'm not like a populist yeah. person, but there is some quantum of populism that exists in the political system. Mm -hmm. And it would be better for it to be distributed more evenly across the parties rather than so loaded in the GOP right now. Mm -hmm. I think that that itself is destabilizing and that you want to have two parties that are a little torn between yeah. populist and establishmentarian, uh, you know, faces and that right now it's like you have a very sort of like highbrow democratic party and a super populist republican party and it's yeah. dangerous yeah 
Well, I know you did a show with, and that was a question, by the way, from Robilius. Uh, I reworded a bit, but thank you for that. Um, Mr. Hobbit says, has a question here that kind of relates to that. Uh, you did shows with Ben Shapiro. I watched a little bit mm -hmm. of that. You did a show with Glenn Beck. Um, did you, uh, how did you feel after the, after doing those shows? I imagine maybe you got some feedback on those, maybe from some folks from their audiences. Did you get any sense that some of these ideas are marketable there? Um, you know, I mean, like Beck, I don't think, uh, is super thoughtful about policy really. Um, but we had some agreement on like big themes, yeah. uh, you know, actually, you know, Shapiro, um, you have different opinions about, but I, I feel like inside Ben Shapiro is somebody who wants to be like more of a high toned figure. He, he like wants to be the George will of our time, yeah. but the nature of conservative politics has evolved yeah. to like, that's not where the, the market is. And that's just part of the unhealthy uh, realignment trend. I think that I'm, talking about like it's it's like just not true that every single prominent person in republican party politics is like a simpering moron or something mm -hmm. but they put one like john boehner's book uh oh, had some excerpts out today it just it's so revealing about this stuff you know like he is a more thoughtful person than the character he played as speaker of the house yeah. um but his perception is that he was like riding this tiger mm -hmm. and like that's tough that's like a hard a tough, yeah. it's a hard situation to deal with and you need ultimately um you know, some of the media figures, people like Shapiro, people like Tucker Carlson, people like the decision makers at, at Fox, Sean Hannity, like mm -hmm. uh, the choices that they make, you know, matter. Um, and to the extent that they have been steering things lately, it's been in an increasingly irresponsible direction. And mm -hmm. that's that's bad. How do you feel about uh, Biden's presidency so far, particularly the, uh, uh, you know, the, the COVID relief package and the infrastructure bill now that they're talking about now? Of course, the criticism is that both of those uh, go well beyond COVID relief and infrastructure. But generally speaking, how do you, how do you feel about that? I really like the COVID package. I mean, you can nitpick it. But like, I thought it was great. It was a lot of money. It was well needed, mm -hmm. uh, mostly on good stuff to the extent that it was on somewhat wasteful stuff. It's just like flexible financial aid to state governments is like not the worst thing in the world. Uh, right. We'll see what they do with it. This infrastructure plan, I am much more um, skeptical on. I mean, we'll see what Congress actually does. I don't mm -hmm. want to like say it's bad until I see what's in there, but you know, um, He's trying to write a bill that is very, 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 very union friendly mm -hmm. uh, on all respects, just like checking all kinds of, of labor boxes. But then he's also trying to do like visionary industrial policy uh, for the next tomorrow. And mm -hmm. I think it's just really hard to do both of those things like at once, right? Yeah. And they're really working at cross purposes all the time. Um, you know, and some of it is like reasonable synthesis, right? To say like, okay, we want to accelerate the transition to electric cars because that's good for the environment. And then because the auto industry is such a kind of um, tentpole of, of uh, labor, you know, we want to uh, assuage people's concerns about that, right? Mm -hmm. That the transition won't decimate the UAW. So, okay, fine. Um, then you get other stuff where he's like, well, we need to build first class infrastructure for the 21st century, you know, fix our roads. And then you like look in the fine print and there's like, 17 things about strengthening Buy America protections. And like, we need like even more Jones Act. Mm. And it's not just that that's wasteful, right? But like, you don't, I, I know a lot about mass transit uh, because mass transit is a kind of a, a niche issue in mm -hmm. the United States. It's it's relevant in DC where I live. It's very relevant in New York where, yeah. where, I, where I grew up, but it's not mainstream in the United States. And so naturally we are just like not the world leader in like transit rail cars. Cause like, why would we be? You know, the, the places that do this best, Germany, Korea, Japan, they're there. And the best solution for the American cities that need this stuff is to buy it off the shelf 
from the countries where it's more central to their politics. And we don't do that in America because it's also supposed to be a job creation plan. Yeah. But like you're not solving people's transportation problems if you're treating the solution as like a make work job scheme. I mean, if you're, yeah, no, I get what this you're is your, your whole persona is, is, is Bastiat. Um, so, you know, I, I don't need to like reiterate these points, <laughs> but like it's a, it's a conceptual muddle compared to the rescue plan, which was like, people need money. So we'll give them mm -hmm. money. Well, so that actually gets to an interesting point. Uh, Jay Molt 30 uh, asks, I'm a labor attorney. Now that Matthew Iglesias mentions it, I'm wondering his thoughts on the best way to rebuild unions and worker power in the United States. Like, yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, if, if uh, it sounds like that's a big mm -hmm. idea behind this bill, if this isn't the right way to do it, uh, or at least if it's hard to do all those goals you mentioned at once, what would be the right way to do that? In the countries where we see strong labor unions, mm -hmm. and in particular, I think the countries where we see strong collective bargaining uh, be like a functional part of uh, society have just a totally different legal framework, right? Mm -hmm. And they have uh, what's called sectoral bargaining. Mm -hmm. uh, we have sort of big agreement across employers uh, with labor unions, and they try to address like big like wage topics and things in a, in a sector. And we have little islands of this in the United States. My my dad uh, is a novelist and screenwriter, and so he's been in the the Writers Guild uh, for a long time. And so there's this minimum basic agreement across the movie studios with the different writers, and then another one with the actors, mm -hmm. and it works. It it redistributes some of the economic surplus huh. to the lowest paid screenwriters, essentially, um, because you know otherwise you'd have a situation where like fucking everybody would love to have their screenplay produced, right? And you could treat people like total shit mm -hmm. in you know unencumbered from the minimum basic agreement which says that like even the most random first time screenwriter like you got to pay him but also like you need to give him credit yeah. right you can't you can't just like put the producer's nephew uh, on, on the credits things like that so I, I think that that's that's a valuable uh role and a valuable model but in most of america we have this kind of um plant unionism so they've organized the boeing factory in washington mm -hmm. but not in south carolina oh. so then everything that happens becomes about you know from a pro-labor perspective is yeah. like do we funnel the subsidy to the boeing plant that's in the union state yeah. right and that what it means to be a pro-union politician in america is to like send money into the small number of sectors that are unionized mm. or to the like sub elements of those sectors that are mm. unionized um and and you see why that happens from a political economy perspective but it leads to like really dumb policy compared to in like Finland, the unions are quote unquote stronger than in the United States, but they're so strong, 80% of the workforce is in a union. So there's no particular decision that's like the quote unquote pro-union one. As long as people are working anywhere, um, like they're in the union. So that's like the social democratic vision that makes sense. But I don't know that there's any way to get from here to there. Well, that's super interesting because it sounds like, correct me if I'm wrong, you're saying that basically in the entertainment industry, they kind of do that now. I yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's, huh. it's been that way for, for a long time um, in, in Hollywood and they'll get these like fights on the margin, right? So it used to be that uh, animated show were not covered oh. by the writer's minimum yeah. basic agreement. Yeah. And this was like a dispute in, yeah. in the contracting because, you know, the capitalists would try to like escape mm -hmm. its bounds. Um, but it's a very um, uh, functional, I think, compared to the labor relations paradigm you see elsewhere. And, you know, so what, when I was at, at Vox, we had a Writers Guild union. Um, and you know, so it's the same union that, that mm -hmm. my dad's in my whole life. You know, I, I admired a lot, but it's in a different labor relations paradigm. And you're stuck with the same thing where yeah. the, the Vox union's goal is to preserve the jobs at Vox Media, mm -hmm. right? Because 
it doesn't exist elsewhere. So like right. flexibility, change, turnover, people leaving and working someplace else is like bad for the union rather than saying, well, okay, we have some uh, labor standards in the digital media industry. And it doesn't matter which specific companies rise and fall, but that would be a much, you know, uh, healthier way to, to do these things. So we don't, we don't know yet how to get from here to there, but there is, sounds like where we want to go. <laughs> yes. Uh, I have no idea how to get from here to there. I, uh, I have no, no good answer. Right, I've got, can I ask you one more question? I think is a good one to kind of close this. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Calpernicus here and folks, I know we had a lot of wonderful questions. I'm trying to go with the ones that really didn't touch on issues. We, we discussed already. Uh, Calpernicus asks, uh, no, oh my God, somebody is insistent that I ask you about the lab leak theory of COVID. We're not <laughs> wasting time on that. Politics question for Matt. What do you think will be the tipping point for polarization? Are we just going to keep going back from uh, Democratic to Republican presidents and pass maybe one or two good bills through reconciliation a year? Or is something going to give and we're going to ask uh, and, and we're going to, uh, our politics are going to going to change from this kind of polarized status quo? Where, how does that end or does it end? Um, so I read uh, a while ago a, a biography of Teddy Roosevelt. Um, it's called A Strenuous Life. Uh, it's really good. And it made me think a lot about uh, Trump era politics. And the story she tells about Teddy Roosevelt is that, you know, he's this like rich guy. Um, he's like from an important Republican family. He kind of dabbles in politics a little bit, but he's also like an egomaniac and a weirdo. And he, he likes shooting um, and, and he likes writing. And he is, uh, he's not really a party loyalist. He's like egomaniacal and he <laughs> wants to win. Mm -hmm. So he becomes governor of New York and he's trying to be popular. So he's like doing these progressive reforms that the party bosses don't actually like. Uh, but he's not really a partisan. He's just like in it for himself. So he wants to be popular. And then they hatch this idea. They're like, we're going to get rid of this guy by making him vice president. Um, <laughs> so he becomes vice president. Yeah. And they're like, this is great. Like, v VP doesn't do anything. Uh, and then McKinley gets shot. So suddenly he's president. And one guy really just like scrambles the chessboard uh, because he's just like, fuck it, party bosses, like people want these reform measures and yeah. no one could really stop him. You know, I mean, not that like everything he thought immediately became law, but it, it really changed up politics, right? And Trump could have been like that, right? Like Trump showed that the Republican party elites did not have that strong a grasp on their own public. Uh, but he's so corrupt, he's so lazy, he's so ignorant that he doesn't really do anything with that moment of opportunity. Yeah. Um, but I think that something like that will happen, right? Like, I think it would be very out of character for Kamala Harris to um, just suddenly become much more, uh, like, moderate on cultural issues and like say some of the stuff we were saying before. Right. Uh, but on the other hand, she evidently like would like to be president of the United States. It's true. Um, I think that would maximize her odds of being president of the United States. I think she's already vice president. Like the the base can't stop her. Also like she's a <laughs> she's a African American half Asian woman. You know, like she has all the identity politics cred you could ever possibly need, right? Yeah. And if she leaned into patriotism and being a little easygoing, kind of the way Joe Biden is, yeah. but like she could be so much better a salesperson for that than he is. And mm -hmm. like, also she's not a thousand years old and, and stuff helps. like that. And so I think that the polarization, this is something um, my, my, my good friend and, and former partner, Ezra Klein wrote this great book on polarization. Mm -hmm. That's like all about the structural roots of polarization. It's a good book, like everybody should read it. But I also think that despite all that, like there's incredible power of celebrity and like individual candidate centric politics. Mm -hmm. And we are waiting for someone to be um, a little bit more uh, like intellectually rigorous than yeah. Trump or more politically ambitious than Harris, mm -hmm. but to like bust the system up by yeah. just like 
being normal in a way instead of acting like the like um psycho activists who control both of the parties yeah all right. The uh, the that it seems like simultaneously a synthesis of sort of the great man theory of politics or great woman, of course, uh, and the not so great great uh, you know, in one. Right. Be normal and yet be abnormal. You know, yes. in this yes. in this abnormal age, be normal. I like absolutely. That, that sounds good. Um, did you enjoy the uh, your your first experience here on Twitch TV? I did. It's great. I, I hope right hope to be back twitching someday. Right on. Uh, well, there's a great friend of the channel, Destiny, who has a great stream. You might want to check it out sometime. Great community. Great guy. Uh, a lot of great people here on Twitch. Our friends from the Neoliberal Project stream here as well. They're going to be talking to a guy from Congress uh, uh, real soon. That's going to be a lot of fun. So, uh, you know, lots of lots of good stuff. I think they're talking to uh, uh, Scott uh, Peters from California. So, oh, he's good. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. Awesome. Um, yeah. So uh, right on, Matt. Thank you so much for being here, folks. Thank you. Again, the book One Billion Americans: The Case for Thinking Bigger. Great read. Great book. And a great guest. Uh, on behalf of the chat, thank you so much for being here. I really do thank appreciate you. it.